Welcome to today's program. My guest is Simon Allaby, Reverend, Pastor, Storyteller. Simon, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. We've known each other for a couple of decades. Yes. Yes. I think the first time I ever saw you was 1985 when I went up to Durham University to read theology. And I think you, that was the year you came and spoke at the carol service. Oh, in the cathedral. I think, well, I think it was in uh, Emmanuel Church, which we always refer to as the old carpet factory. That's right. But then I went back yeah, and I yeah. did the cathedral. Yeah, yeah. And I remember, in fact, I remember both. But yes. I remember vividly yeah, yeah, yeah. the cathedral being filled. Yes. yes. Yeah, no, amazing place. Absolutely. Yeah. Simon, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in uh, just outside Brighton. I was born in Leicester where my father was a uh, priest in charge of three little village churches. But he died when I was a baby, just over a year old. Yes. And my mum's side of the family were all from East Sussex and I had an uncle who lived just outside Brighton in a place called Wooding Dean. So she wanted to move down and be near him. So moved down there. And so, uh, so was the family in a vicarage at the time? Yeah. Yes. And it was and it was, you know, in those days you, you, know, you had to be out within three months. So it was really difficult for my mum because she lost her, you know, lost her husband and then had to move, had to move away from the community that she knew. So she was... Yeah, she was she was very depressed and went through a very very difficult season. Really, I mean and, that's and hugely kind of moved and... traumatic, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It was because because by the time I was born, my father was dying from cancer. He was he was a chain smoker his whole life and uh, had lung cancer by the time I was born and uh, died a year after. So so all the time that I was a baby, my mum was kind of already grieving for him and kind of caught up with caring for him and then. And then moved, and then moved again, and so yeah, yeah, it wasn't an easy, so it wasn't an easy start. Growing up was was tough. It was. So I so at the age of eight, I was sent off to boarding school, which was yeah, difficult experience. I was um, when I first went, I was really excited because I'd read some Jennings and Derbyshire books about kids going to boarding school, and it was all enormous fun and uh, really exciting and. Uh, and then I got there and the reality was very different because I was it, it really was more homesick. Like, more like Tom Brown's it was more days. Like, yeah, it was. It was more like Tom Brown's school oh, days. So you so, were homesick. Yeah, really homesick. I used to, and then I was bullied, bullied a lot during my... I was there for 10 years and quite a lot of it was quite, quite miserable because I was just, yeah, bullied a lot and uh, very insecure and... Yeah. So, so more trauma. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. And uh, my, my mum... She, I think she was, a, she was never sort of properly diagnosed, but she was sort of manic depressive. So she would be, could be really happy and really lovely and great fun and great sense of humour. And then literally overnight, she would plunge into the depths of depression and be kind of withdrawn. And, and as a kid, you're kind of working, trying to work out, well, you know, what have I done? How can I make this, you know, how can I make this better? So, yeah, so my, my sort of childhood was, was difficult, really, because you know, my dad had died. My mum could be very present or very absent. And then I went to boarding school and, you know, was bullied for a lot of the time and very miserable. And uh, so how did yeah. you cope at school through those years of bullying? So I learned, I realised that um, I could make people laugh. So that was my, that kind of became my defence mechanism was I could make a joke out of anything and I can make people laugh. And that was kind of how I how I survived and at boarding school you just you just have to put a brave face on you can't show any sign of weakness because that will be kind of pounced on so whatever's going on on the inside you have to present something that looks stronger than you actually are so so I which is not really a good way to to live so I kind of grow up hiding my emotions and presenting something that wasn't the reality and on the inside just very often being very miserable and very depressed and yeah so bruised thinking, hugely yeah, yeah, bruised yeah yeah and my my teenage years particularly i was just if if this is if this is what life is then i'm not sure i want to kind of live this you know live this, live this life it was just really difficult and my my sort of prayer to god was well why don't you do anything 
you know, that was my constant thing of God, you know, why? Yeah, yeah. help why? me. Why? Help me, help me. And nothing seemed to happen. So my teenage years, I was quite disillusioned about faith. Uh, you know, it was obviously a Christian foundation boarding school, so we had to go to chapel three times a week, and that was all, you know, part and parcel of it. But I didn't have any sort of relationship with God, and it was just, I'm really miserable, God. Why don't you do something to help? So how did you navigate that season of your life? I remember I was, because I was, I was, my dad baptised me when I was a baby, and then when I was, I think, 12 or 13 years old, I was confirmed at school and uh, I remember you know preparing yeah. for my confirmation and, and Simon for those people yeah, yeah. who are not yes. Anglican so, what yeah. does so, that mean so so generally in Anglican church you're baptized as a baby but obviously you've got no idea as a baby what you're saying yes to so then when you get older you have this service of confirmation where you confirm the promises that were made for you when you were a baby so I was confirmed I remember thinking right okay I've got to be a now's the time to be a proper Christian and, I, and for me at the time, being a proper Christian meant going to church and being good. And the going to church bit I had no choice about. It was compulsory at school and at home my mum would take me. But it was, you know, it was, just seemed a bit boring. When I, when I was a kid at home, my mum would take me to church. We'd sit on the back pew. And at the end of every hymn, I would say, was that the last song, mummy? And four times out of five, it wasn't. Because I was just desperate to, you know, to get out. So church was kind of a bit, a bit boring. And, and being good, I just wasn't very good at being good. <laughs> when I was at school, I was, I was really naughty. And, um, you know, if there was a school rule, that was a challenge. It was like, well, how can I break it? How can I get around it? How can I outsmart, yeah. you know, the authorities? So, so I used to steal loads of stuff. I used to shoplift. And I had a reputation at school. If anything went missing, my um, housemaster, I'd be like the first person he'd come to speak you say Alibi do you know anything about this and yes sometimes I did sometimes I didn't so I kind of so my teenage years I was like well I want to be a proper Christian and and but going to church that's boring and being good I'm just not very good at being good I just feel guilty because I do all these things wrong but then at the age of 17 I went to my sister was at London University and I went to stay with her for a weekend and she just talked to me over the weekend about that being a Christian wasn't just about going to church and trying to live a good life. It was about a relationship with Jesus, which I'd never, I'd never understood that. And she gave me a little book by, that you all know very well, by Norman Warren, oh, Journey into Life. Journey into so, yes, Life. It's amazing how many people have come to faith through, through that. reading that little booklet. So she gave me that booklet. I remember on a Saturday evening, 23rd of January, 1982, I sat on the edge of the bed in the, the room that I was staying and I just read that little booklet. And I just thought, you know, Jesus, if you went to the cross for me because you loved me and you, you, know, you gave up your life for me, then, then what else can I do other than live the rest of my life for you? So I just I prayed the little prayer at the, uh, at the back and, um, you know, there were no you know, claps of thunder or <laughs> neon lights. Or, but the thing that changed in the week after I prayed that prayer and invited Jesus into my life was all the time at school, my language was terrible because that was the language that kids used. When there were no adults around, you know, the language was just yeah. blue and my language was just, it was appalling. And I knew if, if my mum ever heard me use those words, you know, she'd have gone ballistic. Uh, and I tried, uh, I think around the time I was confirmed, I tried to stop swearing because I thought if I'm going to be a good Christian, I need to clean up my act. So there were a lot of areas to cover. I thought, let's go with language first. So I tried not to swear for a week and I just couldn't do it. The words were out before I could think not to say them. So I, I gave up because I just thought, this is too hard. But after I prayed that prayer, 23rd of January, 1982, invited Jesus into my life, I suddenly noticed in the days after I'd, I'd stopped swearing. Those words, they just, I mean, they were there, but it's like I didn't have to use them. And that's not to say I haven't sworn since, John. No, but, no, but, what, but, but what's it interesting... Was, I knew something had changed. But what's interesting is that you invited Jesus yeah. by his spirit yes. into your yeah, heart. Yeah. yeah, And the scriptures talk about the overflow of yeah, the heart. Yeah. Absolutely. So your heart was cleansed. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Yeah, I suddenly realised it's about relationship with Jesus. And if it's a relationship, I've got to do something about it. So I've actually got to, I've got to, go to pray and I've got to read the Bible which I hadn't really done before, only kind of in RE yeah. classes and he heard it read in chapel, but I'd never 
looked at it and my sister gave me this little scripture union, kind of little Bible study booklet for, for new Christians. And I can still, I can still picture it now. They, they were like little cartoons and there was just a little Bible verse and a little reflection. And um, I set my alarm for five minutes earlier in the morning. I'd have five minute quiet time of reading this little Bible passage, thinking about it and then saying a prayer. And, and from that, you know, my relationship with Jesus started to, yeah. started to grow. So that started to yeah, cement yeah. the bricks yeah, of yeah. your faith. Yeah. So what followed after that? What so, did you do when you left school? So, well, that's, so that was 1982. So that's my first year in sixth form. And then my, my sister had friends who were on the, the team for a youth camp at Lee Abbey which I know you know Lee Abbey know, very, very well. Loads we of people will know Lee Abbey. Yes. So I went on this youth camp and... Um, and and Lee Abbey uh, yeah, is so it's a, a Christian Holiday and Conference Centre for, basically for renewal in the Church of England. That's why it was founded for after the last war for... But in an idyllic setting. It's on the North Devon coast. coast it's stunning. It's, it's, stunning. Just, it's beautiful. Yeah. So I went on this youth camp and in those days I was, I was painfully shy. After 10 years at boarding school, having, you know, I was like, I wouldn't say hello to a goose, let alone boo. And I remember being in this little Bible study group one afternoon and the guy who was leading the Bible study at the end of it, he asked someone to close in prayer. And I was just so relieved that he hadn't asked me because I thought, whoa, praying out loud. I couldn't think of anything more embarrassing than having to pray out loud. So, um, and I was like, thank goodness he didn't ask me, what would I say? But I came out of that that meeting and I was kind of I was troubled because I kind of thought well actually I'd love to be able to pray out loud yeah that should be a really good natural thing. thing to do with kind of Christian brothers and sisters and I, I went to bed that night and I was lying in my camp bed just drifting off to sleep and just these words came into my mind Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19 just out of the blue I, I think I probably knew Ephesians was a book in the New Testament I hadn't read it but Ephesians chapter 6 verse 19 and in the moment, I couldn't look it up because someone had blown the lantern out and I didn't have a torch. And I was like, oh. but I woke up the next morning. There it was, Ephesians chapter six, verse 19. So I looked it up and um, Ephesians is a, you know, it's a, a book that St. Paul writes in the New Testament. And at the end of the letter to this church in Ephesus, he puts in some prayer requests. And this is one of the prayer requests. And he wrote, pray for me also that whenever I open my lips, words may be given me that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel incredible and i read it and i just thought oh thanks lord you're going to help me pray out loud yeah <laughs> <laughs> but, i look back now and i was that was the moment when he was saying this is what i want you to do for the rest of your life this is this is your calling to make known the mystery of the gospel and i'll give you the words to do it that's incredible so, how god by his spirit gave you the reference yeah 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 which yeah. you were totally unfamiliar with yeah, yeah i had no idea no idea what it was, but it's clear as a bell. Ephesians chapter six, verse nineteen. And you felt the core. Yeah, yeah, and that and that was it. So, so, so after I left school, I went to work for Lee Abbey in London. They run an international students' hostel in Earl's Court. So I worked there for uh, about fourteen months, and I went to South Africa and finished off because I ended up having two gap years rather than one yes. gap year because it took me that long to get into university. But while I was at Lee Abbey in London, people encouraged me to. They said, you know, you've, we really feel you've got a, a gift as a communicator. You should think about going into ministry. So during the time there, I was encouraged to go to Durham University and read theology as a kind of way into that. So I applied to Durham University to read theology and, and, and I went. And that was where I met you the first time. Absolutely. And yeah, just had a fantastic time. And, uh, and then the years roll by yeah, yeah. You, you you got ordained as a as yeah, yeah. a minister as a reverend yeah, yeah. and you've been doing the work of an evangelist for a number of years yes yeah 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 so i was ordained in 1990 i was 25 years old and uh, the interesting thing is i never felt called to be a church leader i always felt this call to evangelism and and and, and a real sense of wanting because i always think that the best evangelist is a healthy church. Yes. That's the best evangelist, is a, is a healthy church that has a community of people who, who love Jesus and are doing the stuff that Jesus does. Because when I read the Gospels, the thing that I see is, is Jesus is always surrounded by a crowd of people who are there because they, they're fascinated by what they hear and they're fascinated by what they see. And the church should be a continuation of the ministry of Jesus. That's what we read in the book of Acts. It's the church they 
you know, they, they said the things that Jesus said, they did the things that Jesus did, and there's this kind of crowd around them. So I've always had this thing in my mind of, as a church leader is, well, where's, where's the crowd? Um, one of the ministries that you birthed yeah. and oversee is called Turn the, yeah, page. Turn the page. Tell us about that. So, well, I love, I love stories. I love stories. And if you, you know, if you have a really good novel, you know, it's a real page turner, isn't it? You just want to keep turning the pages to kind of find out, you know, how the thing's going to end. And, and, and it says of Jesus that he never spoke unto them without telling a story. Yeah, a yes. parable. And, and we, yeah. you know, we just, as human beings, we love, we love stories. You know, when you're, you know, when you're speaking, when you're preaching, as soon as you start telling a story, there's a, there's a change in the atmosphere because suddenly people are like, ah, they're, they're, they're kind of engaged. And I've always had this thing that, you know, most people have those moments where they think, you know, there must be more to life than this. You know, everyone kind of has those little moments where you're frustrated about something or something hasn't gone right and you think, oh, there must be more to life than this. But what does the more look like and, and where do you find it? So Turn the Page is all about telling stories to provoke people to keep asking questions and to keep exploring and keep turning pages and to keep thinking, well, well, maybe there is, there's something I'm missing out on. Maybe there's something that I, I could be engaged with that I'm not engaged with at the moment. Maybe there is more to life than this, but where do I, you know, where do I find it? So I tell stories to try and point people to Jesus. And I've got some of your, yeah, yeah. your stories here, Simon. Uh, yeah. what, what I love about, you know, so many of your booklets is, is they're booklets yeah, rather yeah. than books. In other words, it's more bite size. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think sometimes uh, we've got to communicate truth bite size, don't we? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, my and, stories are really short. And you're, like... you're, you're very good. Now, uh, was, this was your first one, wasn't it? It was, yes. My dog ate, ate the sponge. The sponge. Buns. Yeah, I mean, yeah. how did you come up with that title? That title. Because one of the stories, we, we had a dog, sadly we lost him a little while ago. But um, the story is about self-control. And we had this lovely dog, Percy. And when the kids were younger, they baked 24 sponge buns. And they left them out on the kitchen to cool. And then we kind of left them. And then we came back and half of them were gone. And then we noticed that the dog was kind of lying on the floor looking a bit sheepish. Yes. And so the story is, so what I do is to try and find things that are kind of familiar and then use them to say something about the gospel. So the story is about, well, our dog had no self-control whatsoever. Actually, the Bible says that self-control is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So actually, if, if we want to be self-controlled, we need the Holy Spirit. Because actually without the Holy Spirit, without a relationship with God, we're not very self-controlled, which is why we end up in a mess so much of the time. Absolutely. So, so that's why I ended up with um, with that title. He, he became the, the kind of the title story. Was well, can you read us a job. couple of your stories? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd love to. So um, the first story that I, that, um, that I ever wrote is this one. So this kind of began, turn the page really, this was the first one. And uh, it's a story called It's Not That Bad. And in my last year at university, I became the proud owner of a Datsun Sunny 120Y. One evening, I reversed it into my next door neighbour's brand new silver Audi estate, putting a large dent in the front wing. It occurred to me that I could suggest to him that if he looked at his car as a whole, most of it was still in perfect condition. And it taken in that context, the dent in the front wing wasn't really that much of a problem. But on reflection, I realised that the dent would still be his main concern because that was the part of the car that needed fixing. I think we often take this approach in our relationships with God and with other people. We know that there are areas of our lives of which we are ashamed, so we hide those parts and instead present our best bits. The Bible, however, says that God loves us so much that while he great, takes great delight in the things that we do well, he also lovingly draws attention to those areas of our lives that are less than perfect, not to condemn us, but so that we may find forgiveness, reconciliation, and fullness of life. So that was that's the story that started that started turn the page. Started turn the page. You, telling a story of life and yeah. through it that that spiritual principle. Yes. In yeah, our yeah. lives. Yeah. No, very, very powerful. So that, and that was a true story. Yes, yeah, no, that's an absolutely true story. I can picture it as if it happened yesterday. So and what? the interesting thing is when I reversed into his car, my first reaction was just to drive off and not say anything, which I think is an interesting reflection on human nature. 
we don't like being caught which no. is why we hide stuff. We, we don't want to admit to no. stuff. And then I thought, it's my next door neighbours. <laughs> it's not going to take Sherlock Holmes to work out what's happened here. I'm going to have to fess up. I remember when I, I was learning to drive and our mutual friend, Andy Konomides, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. was taking me out on a driving lesson. And uh, I, I went into I another car, a park car. <laughs> and then uh, and I got out and I said to Andy, oh, we we've got to knock on all the doors to find out whose car it is so we can tell them that we've yeah. knocked into the car. Oh. And when we found it, we told them. And then when I got home and told my parents that I knocked on all the I'm doors, right. they were just furious. <laughs> Why didn't you just drive <laughs> off? And it's like, well, because I'm a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's so, so important. So what was the outcome of yes. that car story? Well, he was actually really lovely. I mean, I did have to pay for the repair, but yeah. he, was, he was really lovely. He was like, no, it's fine. It's an accident. We can get it fixed. So I kind of learnt my lesson. I did have to pay for his new front wing, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but he, was, he was lovely about it. So. As you look back, Simon, uh, over your life, uh, I know you've had some setbacks in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And parts of your life have felt like a roller coaster, haven't yeah, they? Yeah. Yes, yeah. How has God helped you get through those periods? Yeah, I think the thing that I've the thing that I've learned is, you know, sometimes we talk about Jesus being a rock. Jesus is the rock. And the thing that I've learned is that is absolutely true. That if you depend on Jesus, he doesn't he doesn't budge, he doesn't shift, he doesn't move. Um several years ago uh, you know, you know, John, my, you know, my, my marriage sort of, you know, yes. came to an end. Of, but in, in the, um, you know, obviously that was an incredibly painful season. And in the kind of immediate aftermath of that, I was kind of reaching out for things that I thought would help and that would get me through the emotional pain of sort of processing all of that. And, and there are things that I reached out to that just weren't very helpful. But the thing that I, I chose to do every day was I just thought, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus because I don't want my testimony to be, this crisis has crushed me and has knocked me out of ministry and what God's called me to do. I want my testimony to be that Jesus's victory on the cross was a victory over all of this stuff and that there is, you know, there is hope. And so I just, in that season, I learned to put my trust in Jesus every single day. So Simon, any of our viewers, yeah. listeners, who don't yet know Jesus, what would you say to them? I would say one of the things that Jesus said when, when he first started his public ministry and, and people were trying to work out who he was and they were asking questions, well, you know, who are you? And the thing that Jesus said is, well, come and see, come and see, come and hang out with me. So I would say if you, if you don't yet know Jesus, but you're interested find a place where you can kind of hang out with Jesus, which basically means find a place where you can hang out with people who, who know who Jesus is. Find a community of people who, who love Jesus and who love each other and just spend time with them. You know, a lot of the disciples who hung out with Jesus, it took them a long time to even begin to work out who he was, but they loved being with him. They loved hanging out with him because he was kind, he was generous, he was loving, he told funny stories. They just, they hung out with him and over time, they discovered who he was. So if you don't know Jesus yet, I would really encourage you, find a community of people who do and just hang out with them and let Jesus take you on a journey. Because the thing is, Jesus is far more enthusiastic about having a relationship with us than we are with him. So if we, if we sort of even turn a little bit and shift our eyes to him, uh, you know, he'll come running down the road to greet us. So that would be my encouragement. You know, start turning pages and start pursuing Jesus and see what you find. And for anyone, Simon, who actually you open the door mm. and let Jesus yeah. in. I open the door and let Jesus in. Yes. If anyone wants to open the door now, would yeah. you lead them in a prayer yes. to do that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to pray and just, if you want, just repeat the words in your heart or aloud after me. But... Um, yeah, uh, my dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for loving me so much that you sent your son Jesus to die for me. 
Father, I know I've messed up and I've made mistakes. And I ask that you would forgive me today. That you would wash me clean. And would you fill me with your Holy Spirit today to help me live the rest of my life for you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, we pray that you will know Jesus' forgiveness, cleansing and healing, that you would know his peace and that you would know his presence and his protection. Can I encourage you uh, to read the Bible, especially the New Testament? Start with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and find a vibrant local church where you can grow in your faith. Thank you, uh, Simon. Right, thank How you, John. do you see the future for yourself and your ministry? Well, I'm, I'm really excited. I think the, the older I get, the more excited I get. And I get excited for two reasons. One, because I'm getting nearer to the day when I'm gonna meet Jesus. So, you know, we live in a culture where everyone wants to stay young. I really like, I'm, you know, I'm not looking forward to, you know, bits not working and falling off or whatever. But I, I love getting older because I'm getting more excited about meeting Jesus. But I actually think I've always sensed for quite a long time that my most productive years for the gospel would be in retirement. Because obviously when you were younger, you got, you know, family responsibilities and parental responsibilities. And I've always, and, and just because of our particular circumstances, that's had to have been a real focus for me. And I've always had this sense that in retirement, uh, I'd have more influence and more opportunity for the gospel. So, so I, I feel like having been in ministry 30 odd years, the best is yet to come. And uh, I think we're living in a time where lots of challenges, but you know, people are asking questions, people are searching, lots of opportunities to tell people about Jesus. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I'm excited. I'm and really of course, excited. the word Simon retirement's not in the Bible. It's not, no. But no, it's no, almost no. like a, no. a season that we enter and we're refired, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get refired and get paid less. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, thank you so much for no, coming thank you, John. on Facing the Canon and Partners, sharing with great. us all the best for the future. Thank you, John. It's been a huge privilege. I hope you've enjoyed that conversation with Simon. And can I encourage you in your own journey of faith? Keep telling the story that's part of his story, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.